So this is a lecture video about foreign exchange market. We'll talk about determinants of the foreign exchange rates in the short run, the long run, and the market participants and the institutions that are part of it. Um, and I'll try to keep it brief. So how the foreign exchange rates are determined in the short run. Um, we talk about this in class a lot, and I make an analogy that rural is actually flat when it comes to investment. Uh, the money can move from one country to the other with ease, and investors always look for risk and return attributes for money. And whenever there's higher return, money will flow towards that country. Whenever there's lower return, the money will flow away from that country. And with respect to risk, as we have higher risk, money will flow away from risk. And as we have um, lower risk, money will flow towards lower risk. And obviously it is a balance between the risk and return. So if there's higher risk and there's a compensating higher return, then the money would actually, may actually choose to stay. So think of it like um, political risk or say, you know, there's a war going on in, in, in Russia and Ukraine and Eastern Europe is on the risk and the entire European continent is actually faced with a risk of higher energy prices and economic recession. And because of this risk, they have to compensate the investors so that they would actually stay. And if they cannot be compensated, obviously money would flow away from them and it would probably go to other countries where risk is lower and, and hopefully or potentially the returns are higher. So in the short run, the foreign exchange rates are determined as how money flows from one country to the other uh, based on the risk and return attributes of investment. And as money flows towards a country, there will be a demand for the local currency for investments and that demand will increase the value of the local currency and as the money will flow away from uh, a, a country then the local currency will not be demanded anymore or the demand for the local currency will be less and that will actually lower the value of the lo um, local currency i also have to emphasize that a lot of the times we talk about supply and demand but when it comes to currencies especially in the short run the supply side is usually not, not a major concern. It is more about the demand, how the money is moving from one country to the other and how it actually generates demand or you know, decreases the demand and therefore changes the value of the foreign exchange. When it comes to the long run, uh, we talk about the balance of payments. And obviously we have uh, international trade, uh, some countries produce more, some countries consume more, and uh, there's tourism, there's uh, remissions, there is uh, all sorts of payments that go through from countries to the others. And in the long run, the balance of these payments will determine the value of uh, each currency against the others. Uh, so think of it like the, for, um, the GDP per capita, for instance, as countries get richer, they will uh, probably consume more and then uh, they will demand more of foreign products and therefore they might actually start having more imports and that would actually create um, demand for other currencies to buy those imports and perhaps they would have a, a pressure on the local currency. So in the long run, we're looking at the balance of payments across all countries in the world where you have a, a, a trade uh, relationship and this trade relationship creates um, the pressure uh, or it, it creates demand for the local currency. Um, you know, just as we have talked about the risk and return determinants of uh, investment uh, in the short run, we, we have similar dynamics for the long run. Uh, when we're talking about, say, foreign direct investment, for instance, um, the risk of the investment and then how much return you're expecting from the investment will be a determinant of uh, that item of a balance of payments. And therefore, uh, in the long run, it will determine the value of the foreign exchange rates. Uh, perhaps with respect to risk, we also talk about how the foreign exchange rate stability plays into the value of it. Um, international investment may uh, deter from investing in uh, countries where the foreign exchange rates is really volatile, uh, where the value of the local currency is really volatile or has been losing value significantly without control, or where the exchange rate is uh, superficially fixed or superficially pegged. And um, 
and because political regimes change, economic circumstances change, economic uh, power change, and when the foreign exchange are not um, floating, uh, then you're basically depending on the local country's economic circumstances and political circumstances to uh, hold the currency value in place. Uh, but obviously, if the foreign exchange rates are floating, then the influence of the government or the politicians is, is minimal. And, and therefore, you know, what you see is what you get. With controlled currencies, the risk of foreign exchange uh, rate stability uh, comes into question. So in the long run, for instance, this would be um, one of the factors into the balance of payments and one of the factors that goes into the relative risk and return. We talk about relativity because it is always a question of investing in one country versus the other. So if you have a uh, billion dollars and you know, you're, you're looking for a country to invest, obviously in the long run or in the short run, um, you're looking for the risk and the return relative to your other investment opportunities. Um, so that's what we mean by that relativity. So why do we you know, trade currencies? Well, just as we talked about the balance of payments, we're talking about commercial trade. So imports and exports, as we have more imports and exports, we have to pay for them. Um, luckily for the, uh, for the US, a lot of the international commodities are traded in US dollars. So that creates demand for the US dollars and not necessarily for US products. For instance, oil is traded in US dollars and you know, it may not be our oil, but, you know, any country that's producing oil has to trade them in U.S. dollars and therefore it creates demand for the U.S. dollar. And therefore, any country who wants to buy oil or, or gasoline or natural gas uh, will need to buy U.S. dollars against their own. And, uh, and that will create demand for the US dollar. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why the US dollar is uh, a, a considered to be a strong currency. Um, and with respect to exports, obviously, as we sell our products, we expect other countries to pay in our own currency. Uh, but again, I have to emphasize how uh, agriculture and energy and, and precious metals uh, and seem to be trading all in US dollars. So that, that creates a, uh, level of comfort for the US dollar's stability. We also have uh, cross-border investments. So if you're gonna be say buying a house in another country for investment purposes, or uh, if you're going to be doing a foreign direct investment, or simply if you're gonna be buying a stock or a bond in another country. Uh, you know, just a few years ago, uh, Argentina had a hundred year bond and I really wanted to buy one. Unfortunately, it wasn't possible to buy in the US, uh, but that's an example of a cross-border investment. Here I am in the US, I wanna buy the Argentinian bond that was issued in Argentina, in US dollars actually, uh, but then for me to buy that, I have to have uh, access to that market and uh, that will be considered a cross-border investment. And we have significant, like I said, again, in the US, we have significant foreign investment in the US for our stock market, especially through New York Stock Exchange. And we also have American investments uh, for, uh, you know, into other countries through cross-border investment. Um, then we talk about, you know, the savings. Um, and, and this is actually interesting because again, in the US, uh, when we're talking about savings, we usually talk about how we have a savings account and then we put some money out of our uh, paycheck and then we just keep saving it. But for other countries, uh, it, it, you know, with local currencies that are not as strong or not as stable, that is a concern. So what they would do is uh, a lot of the times they would actually start saving by buying foreign currency, uh, banknotes uh, a lot of the times, and uh, keep it under the mattress. <laughs> so with respect to these savings, um, obviously not necessarily just banknotes, but um, this is very common. Uh, to buy US dollars or euros um, or, or you know, Swiss francs and then uh, just keep them as uh, savings in their um, you know, respective countries. Uh, so that would actually create uh, a, another reason why we trade currencies. We also trade currencies for consumption. 
um, you know, this, I wanted to actually list this as a separate item uh, to the imports and exports, but uh, it's actually related. If you think about it, if you're gonna go and visit a country as a tourist, you, you need the local currency. Uh, for some countries, uh, this is a significant item. In fact, uh, if you remember in 2010 and 11, uh, when Greece had the financial crises, um, the, the, the problem was that they didn't have the Greek drama, so they did not have a control over the value of their currency. And having the euro as a strong currency uh, made it harder for the tourism industry to um, perhaps do as well as they did when they had the Greek drama. So, you know, this is actually, this may not seem like an important item, but in, for, for many countries whose economy depends on tourism or tourism is a significant uh, fraction of their economic um, activity, uh, the currency trading for the local currency is, 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 is quite significant. So how do we trade currencies? Um, we talked about retail, uh, which literally you and I, as a person walking into a store and trying to buy foreign currency. Now, obviously in the US, we don't buy them out of stores. We, we buy them either through uh, you know, bank branches or at the airport, which really is not the best way to do it. But you know, we, we go to our local bank and then we ask if we could buy euros or whatever you're gonna be traveling and, and, and whatnot. But you, if you are thinking about investing in, in foreign currencies. Unfortunately, especially in the US, we don't really have a, an active retail market. In other countries, um, you know, emerging countries, for instance, emerging economies, you actually have uh, these cambio uh, stores um, or, or offices. Um, and, and banks can also be quite active in foreign trade and foreign exchange. And through these, um, you know, smaller, uh, act, act, you know, institutional activity, uh, the retail can actually buy uh, the foreign currency for investment purposes or for uh, consumption purposes. Um, we then talk about small scale, but at an institutional level. These are small corporations who um, simply need currency for paying for their trade, paying for their international activity. And, um, but it is a small scale, perhaps up to half a million dollars. And a lot of the times you're looking at, again, uh, banks, um, and again, cambio offices. But the activity of banks are on a local basis uh, where you work with your branch, um, rarely with the head office, but um, it, it is, again, contained with um, you know, institutional trading. On the large scale, you have now multinational banks offering uh, currency, interbank currency trading as a service. And they either do this on an institutional one by one basis, or they do this as a wholesale and offer it to small scale institutional uh, traders and, and provide this as a service. So this could be in market making, and this could be large scale wholesale uh, currency sales or currency trading. And um, or you know just facilitating the currency trade for other uh, financial institutions, but again, primarily uh, interbank market or market across banks. Then we have recently, for the past perhaps two three decades, we're talking about the foreign exchange futures. Uh, Chicago Merchandise Exchange, for instance, is one of those markets that offer foreign exchange futures in, I think, six or seven different currencies, and primarily in, in euros, British pound, Japanese yen, and whatnot. So the, the futures uh, basically offer that ability to trade currencies on an exchange floor, and that ability is, uh, is significant because it, it, it brings efficiency, uh, it allows uh, retail and a small scale institutions to be able to trade at an efficient uh, currency pricing. Um, it, it, it provides a continuous market. Uh, it, it, it provides a regulation of the exchange, regulation of the uh, regulatory authority in the individual countries. And, and obviously, it, you know, through the futures, um, it, it, it generates a, a stable market. 
Uh, but like I said, foreign exchange futures are relatively new compared to interbank trading of currencies um, or you know, intra-institution uh, intra trading of currencies. So what are the most common foreign exchange institutions? Obviously, we start with the central banks. Central banks actually dominate the foreign exchange market simply because they are the banks who, um, by law, uh, to their respective countries, obviously, um, you know, they're authorized and they're responsible for the stability of their currency. Um, and therefore, they become a lot of in a lot of the countries they become active participants of the foreign exchange market and um, in countries like us not so much but still their existence in the foreign exchange trading foreign exchange market is quite visible um and and, and obviously they can be a lender of last resort and when it comes to foreign exchange uh trades they can also be uh, an active participant and lender of well the last resort trader in the foreign exchange markets um, so again, not so much in the US, but in other countries, central banks can become active participants in the foreign exchange markets and active traders in the foreign exchange markets, and they can have direct interventions into the foreign exchange market. A direct intervention simply means that they can uh, literally work with banks as if you know, they themselves are a commercial bank and buy and sell foreign currency against the local currency and they do this with the intention of um, regulating their the value of their own currency um, then obviously we have banks smaller banks are usually not as visible in the foreign exchange market but uh, we have larger banks and uh, in the interbank foreign exchange market they're quite visible and then we have uh, you know multinational banks who offer uh, market making services for other banks, you know, uh, they, they become so large, almost like a wholesale, uh, their services dominate the foreign exchange markets uh, across continents, across time zones, and, and they become bank for banks. We then have large multinational corporations and think of it like uh, any corporation who is dependent on imports and exports and multi you know, multiple countries will have to buy and sell foreign currencies almost on a continuous basis. So some of these corporations will have their own trading desks, trading rooms, and they will become, in, in some cases, larger than banks when it comes to foreign exchange trading. Um, then we have, um, as I mentioned before, Cambio companies. Again, this is not as common in the US, but this is uh, very common in, in other countries where you have exchange offices, exchange companies whose main purpose is to buy and sell, uh, a lot of the times, retail um, banknotes of foreign currencies. Um, they also do actively trade with banks and obviously not necessarily banknotes. They could also trade uh, currency in account. And, um, and recently, uh, commodity exchanges like the CME who became participants through offering futures contracts for uh, currencies and um, and CME is just one example there are multiple exchanges uh, here in the US and in other countries as well where you can as an individual uh, buy and sell uh, foreign currencies on an exchange floor um, so I wanted to summarize the, um, the foreign exchange market and who are participants and how do the exchange rates uh, are determined in the short run and the long run. And um, that's all I have for today and, um, or for this recording. And um, thank you. And please let me know if you have any questions. Bye now.